atmosphere, and then a civil war occurred. So for, for Joyce, he particularly used the word stately. It's not quite a state, but it's getting there. And the final word of the book is yes, and that's where we come to subversive joy. And we say subversive joy because subversive, remember the word subversive, it literally means sub, under, and vert is literally to turn, to turn under. That's why we have a lovely poster from Hugo Santos, a Portuguese person here who made the poster for us and really understood what subversive joy was when he turned the ocean and the sky inverted upside down. And that's what joy is doing, to subvert, to go under. And not only that, but by being subversive, to do it joyfully. It's something like the Beatles used to do in the 60s, to lead with a wink and with laughter, not with a pedagogical slanting or judging, but actually just to create joy, but doing so in a very critical and affirmative way of which in a healing kind of way as well. So that's really important for us in the technological uh, viral communities that we're living in, because as we all know, we are surrounded by negative news, bad news, some very dodgy leaders that are getting far too much airplay on our, on our TV rays and all the rest. So the big revolution today is to try to be affirmative. Of course, in an unstable, in an unstable way, James Joyce is no you know, naive person. He knows the trick and the difficulty of being a fully fledged human. So that's the real thing. And joy, what is joy? Joy for James Joyce throughout this book via Leopold Bloom is to be present to oneself literally to be present. And to be present is to live in the actual today, which is a very difficult thing to do, given today we're all obsessed with things like meditation and yoga to try to get us into the present, because it's becoming increasingly difficult in these technological uh, viral worlds that we live in. And to be present is to be close to reality. And what is reality? Well, the only real perfection for Joyce is reality. Perfection is reality. Perfection is understanding and embracing and recognizing all our contaminations. So coming to the very end of that, thinking of joy and presence and reality, that's what love is as well for Joyce. Love is being present. Love is being attentive. And that's what Leopold Bloom tries to do while everyone else is thinking about the past in nostalgia or thinking about the future with anxiety. But Leopold Bloom is the one who is really focusing in and honing in on the present. And again, speaking of contamination, it's that thing. He's both the artist and the scientist. He sees the world with the eyes of an artist and with the eyes of a scientist. So with further ado, or without further ado, we have lots of readings to go through and it's best to let the actors and the words of Joyce come through to fruition. The first reading is, is when we are going to dive straight into the middle of the day. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. Leopold Bloom is feeling peckish, his food, you know, is needed. Remember, this is a book called The Epic of the Human Body. And I think I could go off on lots of digressions, but it's important. Why is it an epic of the human body? Again, returning to when it was written. For Joyce, it seemed to be a craving for killing, a craving for heroic people that were involved in wars or were involved in conquest or involved in the spirit or even the mind. The great philosophers spoke so much of the capacities of the intellect. But Joyce said, where is the body? Instead of what Goethe said in Faust, I am the spirit that perpetually negates. Joyce said, no, my book is the flesh that perpetually affirms. So that's exactly what it is. And for him, there was no dichotomy or duality between mind and body. They were all interacting with each other. The body never lies. And it's that what really reveals us. So in the first, in the first now reading, we're going to go to Leopold Bloom, who's going to be the first person to have a voice of these readers, who's three o'clock in the afternoon, he's eating, and it's the tedium of the day, he's feeling kind of lethargic, he's been to a funeral already, and um, he knows that his wife is actually about to have another affair with somebody during the day, so he's not feeling great about that either, but he sits there, and there's buzz, flies buzzing around, and we recognize then the stream of consciousness that comes in, and even in the kind of gloomy part of the day, in the 16th of June, in Dublin, he still manages to go to a beautiful moment and revealing the spell of the sensuous, the idea of smelling, tasting, feeling, kissing, memory, the five senses of which we are badly lacking in these online technologies today, which we only have the vision and the hearing right now, which are crucial for the eye of the religious saint and for the poet. But as a human being, we for sure need all five senses. So let me welcome Leopold Bloom for the first reading at three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, wonder, cool, soft, with ointments her hand touched me, caressed, 
her eyes upon me did not turn away. Ravished over her I lay, full lips, full open, kissed her mouth. Yum! Mm. Softly she gave me in my mouth the seed cake warm and chewed. Oh, mawkish pulp, her mouth had mumbled sweet sour of her spittle. Joy! I ate it. Joy! Young life, her lips that gave me pouting, soft, warm, sticky, gum jelly lips. Flowers her eyes were. Take me, willing eyes. Pebbles fell. She lay still. A goat. No one. High on Ben Hoof rhododendrons, a nanny goat walking sure footed, dropping currents. Screened under fern, she laughed, warm folded. Worldly, I lay on her, kissed her, eyes, her lips, her stretched neck beaten. Woman's breasts full in her blouse of nuns veiling, fat nipples upright, hot, I tongued her. She kissed me. I was kissed. All yielding, she tossed my hair. Kissed? She kissed me. Oh, beauty, it curves. Curves are beauty. Shapely goddesses, Venus, Juno, curves the world admires. Thank you, Leopold. Leopold Bloom. Isn't Bloom a great word? Blooming. Zooming into the blooming. Well, that was Leopold Bloom thinking about his first kiss with his lover and wife, Molly Bloom. Now we're going to jump forward into very late at night, the Cirque episode. And remember, for people that might have read a previous book of Joyce's before going into Ulysses, the portrait of the artist as a young man, that book ends with possibly one of the, the greatest kind of declarations by an artist of all time when he says, Stephen Dedalus that is, says at the end of that book, welcome, O life, I go to encounter for the millionth time, the un to forge in the smithy of my soul, the uncreated conscience of my race. There's so much in there. Welcome, O life, I go to encounter for the millionth time. So repetition, we always have to go through repetitions all the time. And this is a book, Ulysses, of many tedious repetitions of which we have to experience. And the, the real task is how do we transform the same old humdrum of life into something new, into an epiphany of which we just heard, literally, an epiphany from Leopold Bloom in a gloomy day. And also the forging. The forging is vital for the artist because it's, it's a double meaning there. You can be deceiving and you can also create. And of course, the uncreated conscience of my race. Now in this episode, we're jumping forward late at night in the brothel, of which takes up almost a quarter of the book, where everything um, loses a sense of time and space. It's when they're in the brothel, it's late. everything that's happened during the day comes again to go through the mind of Leopold Bloom. In many ways, Declan Kybert called it the unconscious of the book. And here we have, all the different fantasies, <laughs> desires, and um, I guess disappointments and hopes of Leopold Bloom. And here we have him declaring in a kind of a hallucinogenic moment uh, what he represents. Remember, in one moment, in another classic oxymoron description by Joyce, he is the kind of unorthodox Samaritan. Sorry, the orthodox Samaritan, of course, which is completely um, an oxymoron because no Samaritan is orcs orthodox. They're outside the, the, the dogma or the institute. And he is the heterodox man. So here we have Leopold Bloom spouting and defending himself for the new Bloom's Jerusalem. Gentlemen of the jury, let me explain. I am a man misunderstood. I am being made a scapegoat of. I am a respectable married man without a stain on my character. I live in Eccles Street. My wife, oh, I am the daughter of a most distinguished commander, a gallant upstanding gentleman, what do you call him? Major General Brian Tweedy. 
one of Britain's fighting men who helped to win our battles, got his majority for the heroic defence of Rock's Drift. I stand for the reform of municipal morals and the plain Ten Commandments, new worlds for old, union of all, Jew, Muslim and Gentile, three acres and a cow for all children of nature, saloon motor hearses, compulsory manual labour for all, all parks open to the public day and night, electric dish, dish scrubbers, tuberculosis, lunacy, war and mendicancy must now cease, general amnesty, weekly carnival with masked license, Bonuses for all, Esperanto, the universal language, with universal brotherhood. No more patriotism of bar sponges and dropsical imposters. Free money, free rent, free love, and a free lay church in a free lay state. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting deep into the apocalyptic and the psychedelic. I'm glad I have some toys in the attic. I guess the attic of my apartment is maybe revealing the unconscious of my own soul, but that's another matter. Thank you, Leopold Bloom, for declaring uh, your wonderful um, depiction for mankind. Later on in that book, he's, he's declared as the, the new womanly man. And as he gives that speech, there is a response from various voices, from so-called friends, prostitutes, other figures, who go on to attack him from all sides and revealing this kind of very judgmental, uh, very attacking, hysterical, all to do with chatter. There's a great word in the Portuguese language for, for gossip, for foca. It came over across the Atlantic from Brazil. And I think that really sums up the great idea of what it is to be a gossip, a fofoca. And this reveals this of all the different suspicions and you know distrust amongst people. And we have the, the hysterical women describing him against this idea. And here we have right now, can you please welcome from the psychedelic apocalyptic brothel, one of the women. You funny ass, you. You're too beastly awfully weird for words. Arrest him, constable. He nodded, almost extravagantly my nether extremities, my swelling calves in silk holes drawn up to the limit and eulogized my other hidden treasures in priceless lays, which he said he could conjure up. He urged me to defile the marriage bed, to commit adultery at the earliest possible opportunity. Leopold Bloom of no fixed abode is a well-known dynamitard forger bigamist, bored and cuckold and a public nuisance to the citizens of Dublin. Fellow Christians and anti-Bloomites, the man called Bloom is from the roots of hell, a disgraced Christian man, a fiendish libertine from his earliest years. This stinking goat of Mendes gave precocious signs of infantile debauchery, recalling the cities of the plain with a dissolute grandeur. This vile hypocrite, bronze with infamy, is the white bull mentioned in the apocalypse, a worshipper of the scarlet woman. Intrigue is the very breath of his nostrils. The stake faggots and the cauldron of boiling oil are, for him, Caliban. Yep, Caliban. Caliban. Who is Caliban? Caliban, if you, the Shakespeareans amongst you out there, um, he was that slave that was, you know, was his, the servant for Prospero in the Tempest. Caliban, in many ways, represents the colonized, the suppressed, the one that's put down and will not speak the language of the oppressor. That's something special in Joyce. During the time of when he was becoming this great artist, there was a lot of discussion. What language should he write in? 
Should it be in Irish or should it be in English? And there was a break. Of course, Joyce didn't wasn't brought up as an Irish speaker. And there's the famous saying in, in Irish, Tír gan Chonga, Tír gan Anam, uh, a country without a language, a country without a soul, which is very um, scary thought because many of us have lost the language or lost the fluency of the language, even though you might go into the country and see all over the road signs and all the names of the different places that are all tangled into the Irish language. But Joyce knew the restrictions, but at the same time, he had a joyful war to get to. And his joyful war was to go to war with the, the English language and to almost try to outdo Shakespeare. Perhaps he never got to outdo Shakespeare. As Stephen Dedler says in the book, after God, Shakespeare created most. But he gave it a good shot and he gave us two of the most experimental epic novels um, of the 20th century at least and beyond in Finnegan's Wake and Ulysses. So thank you, Valerie, for giving us that fofoca uh, tirade against Bloom. Remember, Apocalypse, which is mentioned in that previous speech, is central. If you really want to be an artist or a poet, you have to be apocalyptic, because apocalypse means revelation. It's not something that should be seen as, oh, oh, this is terrible, we're all going to die, because that is going to happen. We are all going to die. But the poet was to reveal to the person that's reading is to wake up to life. In the face of death belongs that remarkable capacity for awakening. And that's exactly it, because we are all ending our lives one minute at a time, and each of us is going to an experience uh, an individual apocalypse, whether we like it or not. But that's the thing, looking into the depths of the human psyche is actually a way of embracing life in all its glory. And now we're going to turn to our first piece of music. Um, it's called When We Encounter the Contamination. And this piece of music is written especially for uh, this Bloomsday. It's an honor to have David Persson once again creating a piece from scratch with very little notice beforehand. And for Joyce, as he says, he loved to quote Walter Pater, a great 19th century Oxford professor, um, all art aspires towards the condition of music. So the floor is yours, David Persson. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm sure there's a massive round of applause happening all over the world right now, David. Of course, we can't have all microphones on because I think there's a lot of. There we go. There's that's hope taps happening. Hope some of you are still with us. Um, thank you, David, for a contamination instrumental, uh, creative, out of the void. Speaking of the void, one of the great lines of Ulysses, deep in the penultimate episode, is ineluctably constructed upon the incertitude of the void. I'll say that again, ineluctably constructed upon the incertitude of the void. Try and use that line in a bar and say, how are you feeling? Well, I'm ineluctably constructed upon the incertitude of the void. Oh, want a drink? Sure. Uh, that's a line I always use back in the past, but uh, it's getting more and more difficult. But anyway, that's very important. Ineluctably, inescapably um, constructed, something that we construct out of nothing. So literally Joyce is trying to enter into the void to create something out of nothing. And I think David Persone um, gave us a good example of that. Now we're going to jump into the Cyclops episode, which is a great, perhaps the funniest episode in the, the whole novel. At the same time, one of the most sinister episodes in the whole novel. And again, showing that kind of ambiguity in Joyce, showing on one level the great humor that is at the heart of James Joyce's art. And that's something that, again, returning to subversive joy. At one moment in the book, Stephen Dedalus thinks to himself, and the narrator says, he laughed to free his mind from his mind's bondage. He laughed to free his mind from his mind's bondage. And laughter can often take us out of many a tight spot. And Joyce's laughter is resounding throughout the whole of Ulysses. But in this case, in Cyclops, we have different kinds of laughter, a sinister mocking laughter towards Leopold Bloom, who we see him receiving anti-Semitism and not being accepted in a bunch, amongst a, a bunch of men all in this bar, five o'clock in the afternoon, um, in, on Little Britain Street, which once was called, showing the irony of the, the name of the street and all these nationalists drinking their heads off and talking about the civilization um, and all the darkness and badness, what has happened to them. But at the same time, they're almost creating a new dangerous, bigoted idea of what a state is. Well, Joyce, or I should say Leopold Bloom, is the only moment in the book where we see him get a bit angry. And he's angry because he sees himself being put into a tight corner and being told off. And he defends the idea of love. So, but let's just hear a bit of the great dialogue that goes on between Dubliners in a very miscommunication because during the morning there was a funeral. Paddy Dignam had died and which Leopold Bloom had gone to and later on in the day they're talking about this and it shows this misinformation that goes on between humans and also the great joy and humor followed by Joyce's own turning of the actual text. So this episode has both this great colloquial conversation between Dubliners and then turns to these mock heroic descriptions in amazing English prose. So welcome the dialogue of Dingham Dead by Mick Greer. How's Willie Murray these times, Alf? Says Joe. Oh, I don't know, says Alf. I saw him just now in Capel Street with, with Paddy Dingham, only I was running after. You what? Says Joe. With who? With Dignam, says Alf. Is it Paddy? Says Joe. Yes. Why? Don't you know he's dead? Paddy Dignam, dead? Aye. Sure, I'm after seeing him not five minutes ago. As plain as a pike staff. Ah, you saw his ghost then. God between us and harm. What? <laughs> Good Christ, only, only five... What? And Willie Murray with them, uh, the two of them over there near, um, uh, near what you call him. What? what? Dig them dead. Ah, dead. Oh, he's no more dead than you are. Maybe so. They took the liberty of burying him this morning anyhow. Paddy. Why? He paid the debt in nature. God be merciful to him. Good Christ! <laughs> Begob, he was what you might call flabbergasted. <laughs> hey. oh. 
In the darkness, spirit hands were felt to flutter. A faint but increasing luminosity of ruby light became gradually visible. The apparition of the etheric double being particularly lifelike, owing to the discharge of jivic rays from the crown of the head and face, interrogated as to whether life in the great divide beyond resembled our experience in the flesh. He stated that he had heard from more favored beings now in the spirit, that their abodes were equipped with every modern home comfort, such as Talafana, Alavata, Hatakalda, Wata Closet. Having requested a quart of buttermilk, this was brought and uh, evidently afforded relief. We greet you, friends of the earth who are still in the body. Mine CK doesn't pile it on. It was ascertained that the reference was to Mr. Cornelius Keller, manager of Messrs. H.J. O'Neill's popular funeral establishment, a personal friend of the defunct, who had been responsible for carrying out the interment arrangements. Tell Patsy that the other boot which he has been looking for is under the commode in the return room and tell him that the pair should be sent to Cullens to be sold only, as the heels are still good, tell him. Uh, assurances were given that the matter would be attended to, and it was intimated that this had given satisfaction. He is gone from mortal haunts. O oh, Dignum, son of our morning, fleet was his foot on the bracken, Patrick of the beamy brow, wail, Bamba, with your wind, and wail, O oh, oceans, with your world, wail. Sand, shells, but the sea, do you hear it? Oh yeah, the sea, the sea, the sea, oh the sea, the sea. Molly has been quite absent during this um, bloomsday, I'm afraid. We've done something blasphemous, not letting her speak too much. Every year she has a lot to say and she finishes off her own great monologue that closes the book with, ah, the sea, the sea, the crimson sea. Well, we're gonna jump back to the third episode of the book called the Proteus episode. This is an episode that deals with philology, the love of language. And it's probably one of the most difficult parts of the book, which is saying a lot for a book like Ulysses. It's Stephen Dedalus walking along Sandy Mount Strand, really not really knowing what he's going to do for the rest of the day, short on cash, hungry, 22 years of age, thinks he's a genius, but nobody's really listening to him, knows everything, and knows nothing really about life. He needs to go out and experience the chaos until he can write Ulysses. But this is a great moment of showing himself and Joyce listening to the earth, listening to the sounds and how language comes out from the earth. Remember the word ecology. Ecology literally means ecos, which is home, the Greek word for home or household, and logos, the language, the relation, the connection to our home. That's what ecology is. So for something like, when we, don't, when we think about ecology, it's not you know, saving the ozone layer or doing all these things, which are of course very important, but it's also staying tuned to the earth, 
being everything, a mixture, mixture of all the different things that is to be human. And that's what these two next readings reveal, both staying loyal to the earth of Stephen Dedalus through language, by listening. Remember the word obedience, obedecer. It's literally, the etymology is also to listen, to listen. So it's not being a slave, but actually to be obedient is to listen. And the great capacity and great task for us is to try to listen when there's so much chatter. Oh, God behold, when we had the freedom of thinking over the freedom of speech. We have freedom of speech, but we're losing our freedom of thought day by day. So let's listen to Stephen Dedalus in the third episode, walking along the beach as he stays loyal to the earth. And here we understand this multi-species storytelling, the connection of the stone, the sounds, the animals. It's all there in this interpenetration of all things which is crucial to understanding Ulysses and what it means to be a poet before we go up to the stars in this, the, the reading that follows. So let's join Stephen Dedalus on his beach. Ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that if no more, thought through my eyes, signatures of all things I am here to read, Sea spawn and sea rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot, snot green, blue silver, rust, colored signs. Shut your eyes and see. I am getting on nicely in my dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick. Who watches me here? Whoever anywhere will read these written words. I am caught in this burning scene, Pan's hour, the faunal moon. God becomes man, becomes fish, becomes barnacle goose, becomes feather bed mountain. Dead breaths, I live, breathe, tread dead dust, devour a Uranus, awful from all dead. Hauled stark over the gunwale, he breathes upward, the stench of his green grave, his leprous nose hole snoring to the sun. To evening lands, yes. Evening will find itself in me, without me. All days make their end. Okay, yes. From the earth, we will look up now because we were always been stargazers as well as being prone to looking at the earth. Perhaps too much being stargazers, but there's a moment again where Leopold Bloom, at the, the penultimate episode of the book, the Ithaca, which is a questions and answers section, told in very scientific language. And remember, he's looking at the stars and the planets. Leopold Bloom is fascinated by the planets, fascinated by many things, in fact. Um, but here we see him fascinated by the planets. And remember the word planet, if we go back to being a good Joycean, what is the etymology of planet? Planet means wanderer, planeta from the Greek, to wander. So wandering is what they are, they're wandering stars. And Leopold Bloom down to the earth is the wandering Jew, the 20th century figure. Remember, it's no accident that Joyce chooses Leopold Bloom to be a kind of Jew because his mother wasn't Jewish, his mother was Protestant, his father was a Jew. And it's very important for Joyce, through the inspiration of Italo Svevo, a great Italian writer based in Trieste who was Jewish, that was the model for Leopold Bloom, who was also a great writer and wrote a beautiful book called Zeno's Conscience, trying to give up cigarettes. So this shows, in a way, this is the Bible of of, of universal homelessness. Leopold Bloom, in a way that the Jewish century is the 20th century and what happens uh, to the Jews in the, in the 30s and 40s, we all know about. But in the early 1920s and at the end of the teens, Joyce was very aware of the dangers and it was so important that the center of his book, there should be an Irish Jew. And here he is looking up at the stars, the wandering planets, which reveals himself at the same time.
the heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit of our system plunging towards the constellation of Hercules, of the parallax of parallactic drift of so-called fixed stars. In reality, ever moving wanderers from immeasurably remote eons to infinitely remote futures in comparison with which the years three score and 10 of allotted human life formed a parenthesis of infinitesimal brevity. Ever he would wander, self-compelled, to the extreme limit of his cometary orbit, beyond the fixed stars and variable suns and telescopic planets, astronomical waifs and strays, to the extreme boundary of space, passing from land to land among peoples amid events. Somewhere, imperceptibly, he would hear, and somehow, reluctantly, sun-compelled, obey the summons of recall. Whence, disappearing from the constellation of the Northern Crown, he would somehow reappear, reborn above Delta in the constellation of Cassiopeia. And after incalculable eons of peregrination, return an estranged avenger, a wreaker of justice on malefactors, a dark crusader, a sleeper awakened with financial resources by supposition, surpassing those of Rothschild or the Silver King. Hello everybody, I hope you're all still alive, well and awake. Thank you for that stargazing little monologue. We're going to go into a little music episode. At one point in the book, Stephen Dedalus goes into the concert room of the National Concert Hall and this is an opportunity for Joyce to turn language into a cacophony of sounds and music. And um, Joyce, if he wasn't a writer, he wanted to be a musician. And his, mo his mother, no, Freudian slip there, his wife. His wife said, Nora Barnacle, the long-suffering Nora Barnacle said, you know, you should have been a singer, Joyce. Why are you writing? Jesus, why are you writing all that crap? Well, she might have been right, who knows, but I kind of disagree. I'm glad he wrote something, but he was a lover of music. And I've said that before many years. We've all said that many years before. This book, if you treat it like sheets of music and you use your voice every one of us has an instrument literally we have the voice and all we do is play the notes by reading the script and joyce always said if you don't understand me read it aloud it has to be heard aloud he comes from an oral tradition and he wanted to make his book come to life and that especially goes for finnegan's wake which is unreadable on many levels but if you just read it aloud in sections and just enjoy the madness and sound of language then you're getting somewhere so let's hear the music scene and this kind of Gerald Manley Hopkins cacophony of sound amongst the barmaids I can't hear anybody. Can anyone hear? Valerie? I think you need to turn, uh, your, no, mic turn, your, turn, your, turn your mic on, Valerie. In a giggling peal, young gold bronze voices blended deuce with Kennedy your other eye. They threw young heads back, bronze giggle gold, to free fly their laughter, screaming the other signals to each other, high piercing notes, ah, panting sighing, sighing, ah, for done, their mirth died down. Miss Kennedy lipped her cup again, raised, drank a sip, and giggle giggled, Miss Deuce 
bending over the tea tray, ruffled again her nose, and rolled the droll fattened eyes. Again, ten needy girls, stooping, her fair pinnacles of hair, stooping, her tortoise nape comb showed, spluttered out of her mouth her tea, choking in tea, and laughter, coughing, with choking, crying. Oh, greasy eyes, imagine being married to a man like that, she cried, with his bit of beard. Deuce gave full vent to a splendid yell, a full yell of full woman, delight, joy, indignation. Married to the greasy nose, she yelled, shrill with deep laughter after, bold after bronze, they urged each other to peel after peel, ringing in changes, bronze gold, gold bronze, shrilled deep to laughter after laughter, and then laughed more. Greasy, I knows. Exhausted, breathless, their shaken heads they laid, braided and pinnacles by glossy gold against the counter ledge, all flushed off. Oh panting, sweating, all, oh, all, oh, breathless. All music, when you come to think. Sea, wind, leaves, thunder, waters, cows lowing, the cattle market, cocks, hens don't grow, snakes hiss, there's music everywhere. There's music everywhere. Thank you, Jonathan. I got mixed up myself from the technological breakdown and malfunction. Um, I hope we're all here. But yes, we're all back. Technology will not overcome us fully. We will become friends of technology. Now we are going to go on to the second of our two uh, compositions of music. So sit back. I hope you have a nice drink beside you or some snack or a pair of teeth or wherever you are in the world, whether it be Brazil or Mozambique or India or Ireland or Portugal. But this is a song and we've gone somewhere different. This is, I'm introducing Julia Galina, who has been a very productive musician in the band called The Loafing Heroes, which has an interesting history in it on itself. And Julia heralds from Italy. And I've always wanted to ask her to sing a song in Italian. Many times throughout the years, she is singing songs for us um, classic Irish songs, new compositions by different members of this audience. But today she's going to sing a song um, written by Fabrizio De André, a great Italian poet who was born in Genoa, which is significant because Genoa would have been a town that Joyce would have loved, on the coast, full of vagabonds, sailors, you know, good-for-nothings, explorers. Um, and this was a man who loved language himself and played around with different dialects. And I won't say too much because I think Julia will say a few words before she herself sings the song by the great Fabrizio de André. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, we chose, I chose to play this song by Fabrizio de André, who was the best uh, Italian songwriter, in my opinion. And uh, he was a revolutionary, he was um, a celebrant of life, actually. And in particular, he was celebrating the lives of the people that usually were neglected. And he always showed the contradictions and the hypocrisy of Italian society. And I chose to play uh, one of his best songs, I think, that it's called Ho visto Nina volare, which means I have seen Nina flying, uh, which depicts the universe of Fabrizio de André, a universe that is made of fishermen, of farmers, of sea travelers, of sea creatures, and of stars. So here we go.
Mastica sputa da una parte nera, mastica sputa dall'altra la cera, mastica sputa prima che venga la Luce, luce lontana, più bassa delle stelle, sarà la stessa mani che ti accende, ti spegne. Ho visto Nina volare tra le corde dell'altalena, un giorno la prenderò come fa il vento alla schiena. Luce, luce lontana, più bassa delle stelle, Qual sarà la mano che ti accende e ti spegne? Notte venuta l'ombra, l'ombra che mi fa il verso, le ho mostrato il coltello, la mia maschera di cielo su e se lo sa mio padre, mi metterò in cammino, se mio padre lo sa, mi imbarcherò lontano, mastica sputa da una parte in piedi, mastica sputa dall'altra la cena, mastica sputa. Prima che venga la Ho visto Nina volare tra le corde dell'altalena. Un giorno la prenderò come fa il vento alla schiena. Luce, luce lontana che si accende e si spegne. Quale sarà la mano che invoca le stelle? Mastica sputa prima che venga la neve. Round of applause and silence are allowed. Julia Galina and Fabrizio De Andre come together. Um, thank you so much. Beautiful. Um, and we'll go forward now from the universe no, to the What was that? Do I hear voices? Speaking of voices, that's good I hear voices because we're going into the next scene. Of, it's one of my favorite little passages about the Macintosh. Um, we're going to go backwards now in time to about 11 o'clock in the morning when you have Leopold Bloom attending a funeral of Dignam, who later on, through hearing that conversation by, uh, delivered by Mick Greer of, well, they're not really sure if he's dead or not, but that's something very present in the book. Real absence is actually a presence in us. That was something that poet said from Brazil, Carlos Drummond de Andrade, who wrote a beautiful poem called Absence. And actually the absence is actually more present. Very often, tragically, those that are long dead can start to become more alive than ever. We can experience this through a broken heart or someone we love so much that maybe we didn't think about enough when they were alive and when they died, they haunted us for the rest of our lives and became more real and more present. So this is something that ghosts are everywhere in James Joyce's Ulysses. Ghosts in really the feeling of something through our experiences. And here we have a lovely little passage of him wondering, who is that man over there? There's one figure in the, the group of men who go to the, the graveyard and he doesn't recognize him. And there's actually, for those who are interested in this little scene, there's actually a lovely essay on this episode um, about the man in the Macintosh. And the great writer Nabokov, who wrote the, the novel Lolita, was convinced that this man in the Macintosh was actually James Joyce himself. So this book is full of mysteries and here we have both the humor and the mystery of all the shadows that can haunt us through our lives.
Now, who is that lanky-looking galoot over there? In the Macintosh. Now, who is he? I'd like to know. Now, I'd give a trifle to know who he is. Always oh, someone turns up you never dreamt of. A fellow could live on his lonesome all his life. Yes, he could. Still, he'd have to get someone to sod him off after he died. They could dig his own grave. We all do. Only man berries. No, ants too. First thing strikes anybody. Bury your dead. Say, Robinson Crusoe was true to life. Well then, Friday buried him. Every Friday buries a Thursday if you come to look at it. The Irishman's house is his coffin. The chap in the Macintosh is 13. Death's number. Where the deuce did he pop out of? He wasn't in the chapel, that I swear. Oh, silly superstition got about 13. <laughs> if we were all suddenly somebody else. If we were all suddenly somebody else, indeed. And sometimes we can be for a while, because we all are actors, really. We're always acting, performing as humans, sometimes trying to negate where we come from or trying to get somewhere where we don't belong or trying to fit in. This happens being to be a human being. You know, the next scene is jumping straight forward into the unconscious of the book again. We're gonna to return to the brothel. And we picked this scene um, because it reveals the kind of evangelical hysteria that can sometimes emerge and also Again, bringing that dichotomy and fusion of humor and sinister messages. And this is the new world now. And suddenly, Elijah appears, the great prophet from the Old Testament. But it's also an American preacher who happens to be in London during the day that Leopold Bloom hears about. And he emerges in a ghost-like form in the Cirque episode, as I said before earlier, in the psychedelic and apocalyptic episode. When I say, use the word psychedelic, remember psychedelic in the sense that all time and space is bended, all boundaries are dissolving, and nothing is linear anymore. And that's very important for James Joyce. Everything is circular. Remember in Finnegan's Wake, the first and last sentence form one sentence. It starts in mid-sentence and ends in mid-sentence. And really, that's the job of the poet, to throw us into the middle of life. So often, we are brought to the end of life or the beginning or progress and modernization. But for Joyce, the progress is in the process. The progress is in the revealing and awareness of our contamination. It's not trying to be you know, useful or trying to be of a utility or trying to get somewhere, but rather it's always this circular commotion and pandemonium that we have. And this is a great fun episode uh, of madness. And here we have Elijah telling you how it is of the evangelicals, because they're coming, unfortunately. Join on right here. Book through to eternity junction. The non-stop run. Just one word more. Are you a god? Or a doggone cod? Flory Christ. Stephen Christ, Zoe Christ, Bloom Christ, Kitty Christ, Lynch Christ. It's up to you to sense that cosmic force. Have we cold feet about the cosmos? No! Be on the side of the angels. Be a prism. You have that something within the higher self. You can rub shoulders with a Jesus, a Godama, an Ingersoll. Are you all in this vibration? I say you are. You once nobble that congregation 
and a buck joy ride to heaven becomes a back number. You got me? It's a life brightener, sure. The hottest stuff ever was. It's the whole pie with jam in. Oh, it's just the cutest, snappiest line out. It is immense, super sumptuous. It restores, it vibrates. I know, and I am some vibrator. Got me? That's it. You call me up by sun phone any old time. <laughs> Bum boozers, save your stamps. Now then, our glory song. I'll join heartily in the singing. Encore. Jerusalem in your heart. Yep, join up, join up, be saved now. Yes, but now we have a sword, this beautiful sword from the Celtic mythology. Um, you know, thanks everyone for hanging in there. We only have two more readings to go. So hang in there. I know this is crazy. We're online. But you know, Joyce also tried to be, form the first movie theater in Ireland. So this is a man who knew what was coming. You know, he understood technology. And in Finnegan's Wake, there is a TV in the house. Imagine 1930s Ireland having a TV. This was something that was pretty much not possible. So he knew the telecommunications that was coming, whether it be through evangelicals or through Instagram or through all those other gadgets from the sacred to the profane. But you know, what I will say is that this sword is put here because the next little reading we're going to have is Joyce's very bold mock epic depictions of the Irish mythic greatness and you see that was he didn't make too many friends from that either because at this time he had his contemporary probably his only real great rival uh, of irish letters william butler yates who was probably about 10 years older so but they were quite different very different in temperament very different in their art but had both mutual admiration for each other it's no accident that joyce quotes from yates's uh, poem, um, uh, Who Goes with Fergus, that Stephen Dedalus is trying to remember throughout the day. And Joyce very much knew that Yeats was a natural, a brilliant poet, but he also wanted to speak for the bourgeoisie, the, the vagabonds, the different forms, the contamination, while Yeats was going in a different direction to purify, to talk to the peasants and the great aristocratic of literature. Both of them mutually admired each other. Yeats adored Joyce and was always supportive of him. He knew his genius from a very early age. And it's thanks to Yeats that Joyce got to meet um, people like T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, who were really much responsible for getting Portrait of the Artist and later Ulysses published. So Joyce, the irreverent man, even though he was quite rude to Yeats, was always very much a fan of his poetry. Why I'm mentioning Yeats is because this episode shows this kind of dialogue going on, the idea of the Celtic twilight and this kind of renaissance of the Irish gods which had been lost throughout centuries and suddenly in the 19th century with Lady Gregory and William Butler Yeats and the Abbey Theatre, it was all brushing forward into this new nationalism it was very important and of course Yeats was the great poet of the rising nationalism of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, up until the 30s. He was an extraordinary poet who never dipped. But Joyce doesn't call it the Celtic toilet. In Finnegan's Wake, he calls it the Celtic toilet. So there you go. The Celtic toilet, very bold. He has subversive joy. It is funny, it is mean, but we both, we need our Yeats and we need our Joyce. And here we are going to show a little bit of this grandiose Celtic warrior. And it's interesting, given that all the statues that have been desecrated in confusion, some of them rightly so, some of them completely done out of amnesia. Uh, get your history ready, you know, we need some history here. It's good, you know, to know our past, but it doesn't mean we have to obliterate it. So here we go. Figure seated on a large boulder at the foot of a round tower was that of a broad-shouldered, 
deep-chested, strong-limbed, frank-eyed, red-haired, freely freckled, shaggy-bearded, wide-mouthed, large-nosed, long-headed, deep-voiced, bare-kneed, brawny-handed, hairy-legged, ruggy-faced, sinewy-armed hero. From shoulder to shoulder he measured several L's, and his rock-like mountainous knees were covered, as was likewise the rest of his body wherever visible, with a strong growth of tawny prickly hair in hue and toughness similar to the mountain gorse Ulex Europaeus. The wide-winged nostrils, from which bristles of the same tawny hue projected, were of such capaciousness that within their cavernous obscurity the field-like might easily have lodged her nest. The eyes in which a tear and a smile strove ever for the mastery were of the dimensions of a good-sized cauliflower. A powerful current of warm breath issued at regular intervals from the profound cavity of his mouth while in rhythmic resonance the loud, strong hail reverberations of his formidable heart thundered rumblingly, causing the ground, the summit of the lofty tower, and the still loftier walls of the cave to vibrate and tremble. Whoa! By God! Good one, Keith. That was Keith Harrell, a regular who before I was even born was singing out Ulysses. Wonderful, tremble indeed from Nisa, thank you. If I could read all the comments, I would, but I'm just trying to focus on keeping it together, keeping it together, keeping it together. So wonderful, there we have it, the great warrior. And there he is with his sunglasses and his headphones and his hat. He understands he's ready for technology, for the new warriors that are ahead of us. By God, the cultic toilette is here indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the last of the, the readings. I hope you've enjoyed some of them, all of them, a few of them, and the music too. I forgot to mention a very vital element of subversive joy, which is central to Leopold Bloom, is kindness. Kindness is a revolutionary act. And there was a beautiful book called Trieste and the Meaning of Nowhere by Jan Morris, who was also a great Joycean reader. And she wrote a beautiful book, that beautiful book. And at the end of that book, she says, kindness is the ruling principle of nowhere. And this lovely eulogy to Trieste, Jan Morrison fits, or Jan Morris, I should say, not Jim Morrison, but you know, he's good as well. But Jan Morris, she was a beautiful Joycean figure. She started off her life as a man from Wales, she went off to war, fought against the Nazis, ended up in Trieste, and at the end of the war, and she had a sex change, went through the whole thing. Imagine, in the 1950s, 60s, that was a brave thing to do, a country person from uh, Wales, and was accepted by her family. He, that became a she, was married, and Jan Morris had an extraordinary journey, and also was an extraordinary writer, and understood very clearly the difficulties of being different, the difficulties of having the courage to express what you were and what you are and what you will be. Um, and I think that fits in with the idea of subversive joy. Whatever sex you may be, whatever color you may be, whatever size you may be, whatever ethnic you might be, whatever kind of animal you might be. And I think we all understand, hopefully in the pan pandemic that is upon us, that maybe we learn, need to learn to be connected to all things, not just to fellow humans, but to the land, to all other life species, because that's one problem I always feel is a little bit overlooked. We seem to be destroying every other life species when we need to really embrace them and become connected rather than some alien that has arrived on this planet just to use, appropriate, distribute, and produce everything. If we are to survive for another millennia, we really need to change our consciousness and maybe Joyce can help us. So kindness, the ruling principle of nowhere, that is a revolutionary act. And at the end of this last little piece, even though we haven't given Molly Bloom too many words this day, and she's not getting words for this last one either, it's Leopold Bloom again, talking about love, or at least an anonymous 
speaker talking about love and love you know again love of course as john lennon said all you need is love as banal as that sounds as difficult that is even another person his name is i think his name is jesus christ you might have heard of him but he really just said the best thing about jesus was he said just love forgive love your neighbor if we could abide by those two things the world would be a far better place so you know here we have love as presence as reality as perfection and being attentive and i think all those qualities are present in leopold bloom so let's enjoy a little bit of love but it's no use force hatred history all that that's not life for men and women insult and hatred and everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that that is really life love i mean the opposite of hatred i must go now love loves to love love nurse loves the new chemist Constable 14A loves Mary Kelly. Gertie McDowell loves the boy that has the bicycle. MB loves a fair gentleman. Lee Chin Han lovey uppy kissy cha poo chow. Jumbo the elephant loves Alice the elephant. Old Mr. Vershoil with the air trumpet loves old Mrs. Vershoil with the turned in eye. The man in the brown Macintosh loves a lady who is dead. His Majesty the King loves Her Majesty the Queen. Mrs. Norman W. Chopper loves Officer Taylor. You love a certain person and this person loves that other person because everybody loves somebody but God loves everybody. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Thank you so much Mandy for that depiction. I wholeheartedly agree and I think we all do and that's the end of our readings but I will say it's one more word before we go. I would, invite, I would invite you all to turn on all microphones because even though, and that belongs to Aoife who has kindly brought us all together um, and has been, has Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. I really like that that last uh, last speech. <laughs> well, it's not over yet, ladies and gentlemen. I know what, what happened yet was Bartholomew that you muted <laughs> everybody else. I was mute. Oh, so you couldn't hear me. Okay. <laughs> the most profound words there. But I will say one thing. Molly Bloom gets the last word. But I want you to join me because the last episode is called Penelope episode in bed, eight sentences, stream of consciousness. And I want you to join me to say the word yes seven times because that's how it ends. Even though nothing, nothing is really reconciled in this book. Remember, he climbs into the bed of his wife who's just had sex with somebody else. And yet there is a reconciliation happening. She's thought about it and she realizes, you know, Leopold's the man for me after all. And we don't know where Stephen Dedalus goes. He comes home and he wanders off into the night. So it's unreconciled. We don't know what's happening. It's all contaminated, but we're still here. So get your copy of Ulysses, put it on the shelf or in the toilet and just read a little episode here and there. Don't be <laughs> there forever. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you all to say yes with me. And then we're going to have a little jig. Whoever wants to dance for 30 seconds, they can, because it's important. We persevere. Good to see Ned, you're holding Ulysses. Keep it there, surrounded by grass green. So on the count of three, say yes with me. One, 
two, three. Yes. 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 Yes.
Would anybody else like to say anything? I'd like to say thank you so much for everything. An absolutely fantastic evening. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, we were missing so much theater and the lead one players and the great show you provide to us tonight. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful show uh, to everybody involved. And Bartholomew, I don't know how you come up with a different take on Ulysses every year. Every year it's different, it's exciting. And the music, the readings, it was wonderful. Thank you all so much. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Great, terrific. Thank you. If you can hear me. <laughs> we can. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thank you. It was wonderful. It was my first Bloomsday in Portugal, one I shall never forget. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Nobody else wants to say anything? No? Great. Okay. Well, I think, we leave. I think, I think nobody I just, wanted to end. You're going to have to kick us all out. I think. I just, oh, <laughs> can, can, can you hear me? I just, yeah? I just hope that we can all see each other in the flesh on next Bloom's Day. Yeah? So, yes, yes, yes. But then, but then Absolutely, the, yes. The silver lining, yes. of course. The silver Six lining, yeses. The silver lining is that many of you are not in, in Lisbon. And so that's the good side. It was a great experience because we got an op had an opportunity to communicate to different people all over the world, perhaps. So that's the positive side of, of the, the cyber world. But I'm, I'm looking forward to being in the flesh next year. Yes, <laughs> we're all looking forward to going back to that as well. <laughs> Abs I meant to that. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll just say one more word to the actors and musicians. They were just, I gave them a call literally a week ago. Uh, um, maybe, you know, just to say, we're on, and this is what we're doing. And I'm, I'm so grateful for their, their just going with, into the flux and the flow and just going with it and, and, and trusting, trusting in the chaosmos. So thanks to all the team this year, once again, it never gets tiring working with you. And, um, um, and someone said that, you know, I see a different view every time of Ulysses, but you know, it's, it's the book itself that opens up. When someone said once, if a monkey looks in, no genius looks out. So it's important you look in with multiple eyes as well. And these actors and musicians are wonderful at just providing suggestions, you know, different readings. They bring different aspects. They make me see, there was, there was two or three readings in there I hadn't really noticed. And people, there was one or two of the actors said, oh, why not read this? And suddenly it was like, wow, that's the beauty of Ulysses. You kind of can overlook so much. And every time you come back, is that from Ulysses? So thanks so much to the actors and musicians because they were really at the heart of it and to, and to the two musicians as well, who in such a short period of time came up with two pieces of beautiful music. And Ropey and Carlos telling them, just to play a jig now, go, boom, boom, boom. So uh, it all came naturally. So thank you to all of you. Thank you all very, very much. Well, thank I'd you like to all of you for your vision, your uh, leadership and your creativity. Um, you, you allow us to create the things that we do. So thank you. So well done, absolutely everybody. And we look forward to, as you say, Bartholomew, in person next year. So this has been recorded and I will share it on the Ireland Portugal Business Network site. And obviously Bartholomew, you can share it on Facebook or wherever you feel most appropriate as well. Um, but for tonight, I'm going to thank Ambassador Ralph Victory for very kindly sponsoring this event. It was the pleasure of the Ireland Portugal Business Network and the Irish Association to be able to host this for your pleasure and your entertainment. And once again, thanks to Bartholomew and all of the actors and the musicians who really, really, really excelled themselves this evening in very difficult circumstances and extremely short notice. Thank you all. Thank Good you. Good night. Iwa. Good night. Good night. I'd, I'd like to hope that one day you might bring it up to uh, Domino, to Villa Verde, where I am. We're a bit out in the sticks here, but it's worth coming. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> we'll have to make a week of it. <laughs> Doomsday Thanks. Tour. Okay, thank you, everybody. Good thank night. Thank you, Volpe. Thank you, Julia. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.